Today's episode is sponsored by News Voice. As we talk about frequently, media consolidation poses an enormous danger to democracy. So while we all continue to push for effective antitrust enforcement, News Voice has come up with an immediate response to this problem. News Voice is a website and app for iOS and Android, which you can access for free if you go to newsvoice.com best. And it gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating a mix of mainstream, international, and independent media sources. The whole site is fueled by crowdsourcing, so you can upvote stories you think are important, so more people will see them, you can add stories to the site, or you can add a source that's missing for a story. Check it out for yourself by downloading the app for free by going to newsvoice.com best. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast, in which we shall hear the rarely told real legacy of Christopher Columbus and some of the reverberations from his actions that can still be felt to this day. Clips today start with one of Dr. Roger Ray's progressive faith sermons, a clip from the documentary The Canary Effect, the Tom Hartman program, The Young Turks, Pod Save the People, Totally Biased with W. Kamau Bell, and In the Thick. A ritual recitation uh, is written into the 26th chapter of Deuteronomy, and every Hebrew child learns it very early in life. It begins, a wandering Aramean was my father. It's a short history of how the Jews became a people and how they came to live in what they called the promised land. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, in academic terms, that is called the Hebrew Bible's Heilsgeschichte, because in graduate school we like to speak German now and then. It literally means salvation history. It's a version of history told from the perspective that asserts that God made all of these things happen for a reason. The salvation history of the Jews is a symbol for the history of all of the world that followed and the unwritten history of peoples that preceded it. Jewish history begins with a small band of people moving from one country to another in hopes of improving their prospects of having food and a livelihood. Over time, being a part of a non-dominant ethnic group in Egypt made their living conditions bad enough that they left in search of a better place. Now, their own version of that long trip was that God had promised them a land of their own, a land flowing with milk and honey. But a historian might look at that group of former slaves who could not best the Egyptian army that was very strong and well organized, and they wandered north until they found a territory that was dominated by a people that were not organized well enough to defeat them, so they killed them and took their land. If you take the Old Testament narrative literally, God is a pathological land thief. (laughs) But we know that it wasn't actually God that promised them the land, but just that they found a land that they could conquer. Migrations have taken place since the first early humans wandered out of northern Africa to populate Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and finally Australia, and everywhere in between. Sometimes the migrations were forced, as when the Assyrians carried the uh, natives of Israel away to be slaves, or when Judah was carried to Babylon to be slaves, or when Americans and Europeans captured Africans and took them away to be slaves. Sometimes migrations were forced by famine, as when Jacob took his tribe to Egypt, or when the waves of Irish immigrants first came to the Americas. 
Sometimes waves of immigration were instantaneous, as people were forced to leave their land by a foreign power or as refugees to escape a holocaust, as Syrians are now fleeing their homeland, or as Jews fled from Germany and Poland in the last century. People move around, but not usually out of sheer boredom. In the ancient world, you might pull off being a pathological land thief by blaming it on God. You understand that Palestine wasn't a land flowing with milk and honey just naturally. I mean, you ask any farmer, uh, a piece of land left to God's management doesn't produce very much of anything. The Semitic tribes that occupied uh, that land around 1000 BC and episodically had control over it for the next thousand years, they killed off a civilization that already had farms and, and uh, uh, an agricultural culture and walled cities and everything that were already there. They just said that God gave it to them. They became refugees again when the Roman Empire took their land. They didn't get it back for 2,000 years until the British and American empires, to call them that, stole it once again from a people that had lived there for 2,000 years. And in my little church in rural Kentucky, we tended to see history as the Bible and George Washington. So we did, you know, our awareness of what might have taken place in between the two wasn't very complete. And so for, for my people, the reestablishment of Israel in Palestine was natural. It, it was supposed to have, they had the title, it's in the Bible. They believed it was still their land. The fact that the sacred book of the Jews gives them title to the land is not exactly an ethical justification. But seeing that requires critical thinking that not only wasn't going on in my little Sunday school class in rural Kentucky, but it wasn't going on in the British Parliament and it wasn't going on in the American Congress. We saw the solution to a European sin as being a land grab from Middle Eastern people. And it hasn't worked out very well, has it? I don't know how to undo it. But a part of our American myth was a poem that we learned in grade school. Most of you could recite it from memory. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. He sailed by night. He sailed by day. He used the stars to find his way. The poem concludes, The Arakawa natives were very nice. They gave the sailors food and spice. Columbus sailed on to find some gold to bring back home, as he'd been told. He made the trip again and again, trading gold to bring to Spain. The first American? No, not quite. But Columbus was brave, and he was bright. The poem's a myth. It's a lie, of course. Some of the names and dates reflect actual history. The poem does not say that the Spaniards captured and enslaved the Arawak Indians, and those who refused to be enslaved were slaughtered. There were those who spoke of the Americas as a new promised land, promised by God to Christian invaders. <clears throat> that language survived right up to the time of Abraham Lincoln and continued to inspire the wars waged against the indigenous peoples of this continent. There are now about 300 million people that live in the United States, but our white European forefathers did not find this place uninhabited any more than ancient Semitic tribes found Palestine uninhabited, or modern Jews did not find Palestine uninhabited at the end of World War II. There are estimates as high as 90 million indigenous Indians living here when European settlers began their migration. There are not many other periods in our history when you can say that the Jewish Holocaust pales in comparison to what our ancestors did to the American Indians. Of course, it wasn't entirely a military occupation. European diseases that traveled across the Atlantic in those little wooden ships were more lethal to Indians than were the swords and muskets of the settlers. 
Still, once early American settlers discovered the lethal vul vulnerability of the Indians to those diseases, they did everything they could to spread those germs to do what they could not do themselves. At the end of World War II, many Germans were put on trial for war crimes, and a number of steps were made to heal the sick mentality that led to the Holocaust. In Japan as well, a new constitution was written, and a very ancient culture had to go back to the drawing board to reckon with how they had treated primarily their Asian neighbors in the invasions of China and Korea in their lust for power. In Germany, you would not find a holiday to celebrate the birth of Adolf Hitler. To even suggest it would be offensive to Germans. In the United States, however, we are still Holocaust deniers because we have an official Columbus Day to celebrate the first voyage of Columbus to the New World to begin the legacy of slavery and carnage. There is no way to put that 15th century migration into reverse, but folks, we can start to be honest about it. Christopher Columbus is a part of modern history, but he's not a bright and shining part of it. Oh, calling Columbus brave and bright, how insulting is that to Native Americans? The state of Vermont and the cities of Denver and Phoenix recently joined Seattle, Minneapolis, Albuquerque, and a dozen other American cities in deciding to rename the second Monday in October Indigenous People's Day. Now that may seem like a small thing, just changing the name from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. But one of the things I've had to learn over the years is that language makes a difference in how we think. And if we can change the language, we can begin to see the plight of Native Americans differently. Everybody thinks that 1492 is some magic date in which Columbus discovered, quote, America. But Columbus was in the Caribbean, and he never uh, at any time came to the United States. No, he never was near the continental mass of America. He, the great navigator that he was, you know, who washed up on a beach in the Caribbean, half a world away from where he thought he was, gets known as the great navigator. The navigator could never find his way from the island to the mainland. He couldn't discover the continent. Oh, I think it is rather surprising that they should have reddish brown skins. But now since we have landed in India, then these people must be Indians. It's very interesting that uh, Columbus's first comments regarding the Native American or the indigenous people was that they were uh, very loving, giving, they would uh, trade or give anything uh, that they uh, had. They were without malice, without guile. Uh, the, the whole concept that Columbus thought these were savage people was uh, totally incorrect. part of India, San Salvador, and I take possession of it in the name of the King and Queen of Spain. It's hard to discover an occupied territory. I often go for the first time to visit people who have moved into the area. It may be the first time I've been to their living room, but I can hardly say I discovered it. I mean, after all, they lived there. Much less can I extrapolate by virtue of my uh, noble achievement of knocking on their door that somehow or another the newly discovered living room becomes mine. The general consensus is that Spain came for God, glory, and gold, and God being that they were going to spread the Catholic religion, glory because they were going to add more uh, land to the crown, and, and of course gold because they were going to get rich. Columbus had no trouble getting ships and men for his second voyage, but he still hadn't the slightest idea that he was headed for the vast continent of America.
they issue documents to the native people to be read to the native people saying if you don't uh, if you don't convert to Catholicism and give us the gold, we will do all types of harm to you. We will kill your families. We will take your land. We will enslave you. And when native people uh, didn't tell them where they, the gold was, or in many cases didn't know where the gold was, the Spanish simply tortured these people. They burned them at the stake alive. They had, uh, they had uh, large hunting dogs that they fed the Indians to. It was death and destruction. Bartolome de las Casas, who was there during Columbus's tenure as governor of the island, placed the beginning population at about three million. Twentieth century historical demographic studies had placed it as high as eight and a half million. Whatever the reality actually was, it had been reduced to about a hundred thousand by the time he left, and by 1550, it was gone. Extinct. Columbus is symbolic, but what Columbus symbolizes is hideous. Columbus being valorized in the mythology of the United States is roughly the same as Germany valorizing Heinrich Himmler now and then teaching this to Jewish students as well as German students and conditioning them to accept it. But each year on October 12th, we celebrate Columbus Day. The anniversary of that day in 1492, when Columbus first sighted the land of the new world, America. And now for the Midterms Minute, look at the candidates and races and battleground districts that you need to know about, shout about, and support to make the biggest impact possible in the elections on November 6th. And a reminder that we've set up the Midterms Minute HQ at bestofleft.com slash midterms, where you can view every spotlight segment we produce, every battleground race in the country, all the Justice Democrats, brand new Congress, and our revolution candidates running in November, volunteer resources, and more. Again, that's at bestofleft.com slash midterms. Today, we're going to talk about the battleground races in New York, which is one of five states the political wonks say will determine the majority in the House. Many of these districts are upstate, an area that polling shows doesn't seem to be responding to the blue wave fever. Senator Gillibrand and Governor Andrew Cuomo are both all but locked in for their re-election, so we'll jump right into the House races. In New York's 11th district, which includes Staten Island, Democrat Max Rose is challenging Republican incumbent Daniel Donovan. Donovan actually voted against Trump's health care and tax bills in 2017, but is still a big Trump supporter and was endorsed by the president during the primary. Rose, a former nonprofit health care executive, is running on a burn the house down campaign that calls out establishment Republicans and Democrats for failing the people, saying they all got to go. This race is rated by the Cook Political Report as likely Republican. In New York's 19th district, Democratic attorney Antonio Delgado is challenging Republican incumbent John Faso. Delgado's campaign is focused on establishing universal health care coverage through a public option, while Faso voted for the Trump care bill and didn't bother to show up to the town halls his constituents demanded. Faso has also been called out for racial dog whistling for using lyrics from Delgado's old rap songs in attack ads to call him an outsider with different values. But Faso is now behind in the polls in a district where Trump surged and is being outraised by Delgado. This race is considered a toss-up. In New York's 22nd district, Democratic Assemblyman Anthony Brindisi is challenging Republican incumbent Claudia Tenney, who has received at least $100,000 from health insurance companies and falsely stated that, quote, so many of these people that commit the mass murders end up being Democrats, unquote. Although Trump surged here with a 16-point win, Brindisi significantly outraised Tenney in the first quarter and had a four-point lead in the polls at the end of August. The race is currently rated a toss-up. 
New York's 27th district was almost an open seat race after Trump allied Republican incumbent Chris Collins announced he was suspending his campaign. Then days later, he was arrested and indicted by the FBI for insider trading. This put the seat in play, but Republicans were having trouble finding a new candidate. However, a few weeks ago, Collins resurfaced, saying he's back in the race because, quote, the stakes are too high to allow the radical left to take control of the seat in Congress, end quote. Democrat Nate McMurray is challenging Collins, but it is still an uphill climb in one of the reddest districts in the state, and Democrats haven't officially promised funding support. The National Republican Congressional Committee chairman has said he won't spend a dime in this race because he's confident, despite the FBI indictment, Collins will win. The race is currently rated as leaning Republican. To vote in the midterm elections in New York, you must be registered, have your application postmarked, or have made an in-person request by October 12th. Absentee ballot options and deadlines are complex, so we recommend taking a look at the elections.ny.gov website for that information. It's never too early to check registration cutoff dates and absentee ballot requests and submission dates in your own state. We highly recommend reviewing your state's important dates and voter ID laws at rockthevote.org as soon as possible to ensure you'll be able to vote in the general election. Links to all of the information you heard today, as well as additional resources, are linked in the show notes, and today's Midterms Minute, along with all of our election information, can be found at bestoftheleft.com slash midterms. So if making the blue wave a reality in November is important to you, be sure to hit the share buttons to spread the word about supporting Democrats in battleground races across the country via social media so that others in your network can spread the word too. You fly over the country of Haiti on the island of Hispaniola, the island on which Columbus landed. It looks like somebody took a blowtorch and burned away everything green. Even the ocean around the port capital of Port-au-Prince is choked for miles with the brown of human sewage and eroded topsoil. From the air, it looks like a lava flow spilling out into the sea. The history of this small island is in many ways a microcosm for what's happening in the whole world. When Columbus first landed on Hispaniola in 1492, virtually the entire island was covered by lush forest. The Taino Indians who lived there had an apparently idyllic life prior to Columbus from the reports left to us by literate members of Columbus's crew, such as Miguel Cuneo. When Columbus and his crew arrived on their second visit to Hispaniola, however, they took captive about 2,000 local villagers who had come out to greet them. As Cuneo wrote in his diaries, quote, When our caravels were to leave for Spain, we gathered 1,600 male and female persons of those Indians, and these we embarked in our caravels on February 17, 1495. For those who remained, the remaining Spaniards, we let it be known to the Spaniards who manned the island's fort in the vicinity that anyone who wanted to take some of them could do so to the amount desired, which was done. In other words, they gave away the, the slaves, the Indians. Cuneo further notes that he himself took a beautiful teenage Carib girl as his personal slave, a gift from Columbus himself, but that when he attempted to have sex with her, she, quote, resisted with all her strength. So, in his own words in his diary, he, quote, thrashed her mercilessly and raped her, end quote. While Columbus once referred to the Taino Indians as cannibals, a story made up by Columbus, which is to this day still taught in some U.S. schools to help justify his slaughter and enslavement of these people, He wrote to the Spanish monarchs in 1493. This is quoting from Christopher Columbus. It is possible, with the name of the Holy Trinity, to sell all the slaves which it is possible to sell. Here there are so many of these slaves, and also Brazil would, that although they are living things, they are as good as gold. Columbus and his men also used the Tainos as sex slaves. It was a common reward for Columbus's men for him to present them with local women to rape. As he began exporting Tainos as slaves to other parts of the world, the sex slave trade became an important part of his business. As Columbus wrote to a friend in 1500, quote, A hundred Castellanos, a Spanish coin, are as easily obtained for a woman as for a farm, and it is very general that there are plenty of dealers who go about looking for girls. Those from nine to ten years old are now the most in demand, end quote, from Christopher Columbus. However, the Taino turned out not to be particularly good workers in the plantations that the Spaniards and later the French established on Hispaniola. 
They resented their lands and children being taken and attempted to fight back against the invaders. Since the Taino were obviously standing in the way of Spain's progress, Columbus sought to impose discipline on them. For even a minor offense, an Indian's nose or ear was cut off so he could go back to his village to impress the people with the brutality the Spanish were capable of. Columbus attacked them with dogs, skewered them with pikes, and shot them. Eventually, life for the Taino became so unbearable that as Pedro de Cordoba wrote it to King Ferdinand in a 1517 letter, quote, As a result of the sufferings and hard labor they endure, the Indians choose and have chosen suicide. Occasionally, a hundred have committed mass suicide. The women, exhausted by labor, have shunned conception and childbirth. Many, when pregnant, have taken something to abort and have aborted. Others have, after delivery, have killed their children with their own hands so as not to leave them in such oppressive slavery." End quote. Eventually, Columbus, and later his brother Bartholomew Columbus, who he left in charge of the island, simply resorted to wiping out the Taino altogether. Prior to Columbus's arrival, some scholars placed the population of Haiti, Hispaniola, at around, now at around 16 million, at around 1.5 million people. By 1496, it was down to 1.1 million, according to a census done by Bartholomew Columbus. By 1516, the indigenous population was 12,000. And according to Las Casas, who was there, by 1542, fewer than 200 natives were alive. By 1555, on this island, every single one was dead. This isn't just a story about Hispaniola. The same has been done to indigenous people worldwide. Slavery, apartheid, the entire concept of conservative Darwinian economics have been used to justify continued suffering by masses of human beings. Dr. Jack Forbes, professor of Native American studies at the University of California at Davis and author of the brilliant book Columbus and Other Cannibals, uses the Native American word wetico to describe the collection of beliefs that would produce behavior like that of Columbus. Wetico literally means cannibal, and Forbes uses it quite intentionally to describe these standards of culture. We, as he said, eat or consume other humans by destroying them, destroying their lands, taking their natural resources, and consuming their life force by enslaving them either physically or economically. The story of Columbus and the Taino is just one example. We live in a culture that includes the principle that if somebody else has something we need and they won't give it to us, and we have the means to kill them and get it, it's not unreasonable to go do it using whatever force we need to. In the United States, the first Indian War in New England was the Pequot War of 1636, in which colonists surrounded the largest of the Pequot villages, set it afire as the sun began to rise, and then performed their duty. They shot everybody, men, women, children, and the elderly who tried to escape. As Puritan colonist William Bradford described the scene, it was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire, and the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink thereof, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and the colonists gave praise thereof to God who had wrought so wonderfully. The Narragansett Indians, up to that point, friends of the colonists, were so shocked by this example of European-style warfare that they refused further alliances with the whites. Captain John Underhill ridiculed the Narragansetts for their unwillingness to engage in genocide, saying the Narragansett wars with other tribes were more for pastime than to conquer and subdue enemies. In that, Underhill was correct. The Narragansett form of war, like that of most indigenous older culture people and almost all Native American tribes, does not have extermination of the opponent as a goal. After all, neighbors are necessary to trade with, to maintain a strong gene pool through intermarriage, and to ensure cultural diversity. Today's episode is sponsored by Tidal, a different kind of music streaming app that fosters the relationship between artists and fans and values diversity in music. They offer unlimited music and videos available completely ad-free, so you can play your favorite classics and discover new artists, but that's not all. They also have a social justice angle. Tidal's fourth annual benefit concert, Tidal X Brooklyn, supports criminal justice reform. Tidal knows as well as you and I do that over 65% of prisoners serving life without parole from nonviolent offenses are African American, and one in every 15 African American males is incarcerated, compared to just one in every 106 white men. That means that one in three African American males can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. All net proceeds from Title X Brooklyn help support charity organizations dedicated to reforming the policies that lead to these stats, such as the Equal Justice Initiative, Reform, The Innocence Project, and Cut 50. 
Past concerts have featured artists like Stevie Wonder, Nicki Minaj, Jay-Z, and Jennifer Lopez, so don't miss the free live stream of Title X Brooklyn on October 23rd. Tune in and donate to the cause at title.com slash Brooklyn. That's title, T-I-D-A-L dot com slash Brooklyn. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and what followed was a bloody, greed-filled cataclysm of slavery, dismemberment, extortion, rape, child trafficking, biological warfare, feeding living people to dogs, and general mass murder. So then he got a federal holiday. Can we not? Los Angeles has just ruled to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Some people are pissed off about the move, but not only was LA totally right to make this decision, other cities, states, and the whole country would be wise to do the same. Questions over the validity of Columbus Day have been stewing for decades and it's time to put an end to it for good. Columbus Day is not a great pillar holding up American history. It's the half-deflated bouncy castle of American history. Despite what you may think, this holiday is only 80 years old. William Shatner is older than Columbus Day. He's a much better example of a bold explorer, and he was just on a soundstage. Julie Andrews is older than Columbus Day. Mary Poppins, y'all! Both Sean Connery and Dame Judi Dench, stars of my James Bond time travel fanfic, are older than Columbus Day. It's so recent, and such an oversight. The only reason the holiday was made official was because back in 1937, a group of Catholic men pressured FDR into declaring a holiday celebrating a Catholic male role model. It's all also generally taken to celebrate Italian-American heritage. I have good news for you, though. LA voted to name the day after Indigenous Peoples Day Italian Heritage Day. And the entire month of October is Italian Heritage Month. If you are Italian and proud of it, you can untie yourself from historical thieving murderer Christopher Columbus and instead celebrate the over 5.4 million Italians who immigrated to the United States since 1820. Or Amerigo Vespucci, who this country is actually named after. You you don't have to let one horrible person be the bannerman of your pride. Sad truth is, with the information age, we've become very aware of what Christopher Columbus was. If you don't count the native people, and I don't see why you wouldn't unless you don't like to count inconvenient non-white people and don't see the irony of shouting, we will not be replaced, at the people who lived here First, Leif Erikson got to the New World centuries before Columbus, yet you don't see Americans celebrating him every year with jugs of mead. Columbus did not convince the world that the Earth wasn't flat. This was commonly known since the time of the ancient Greeks, as early as 6th century BC. Yes, Columbus mapped the coasts of Central America and South America, but he never even set foot on North America. He spent his life believing he discovered Asia. He should be remembered not for his incredible discovery, but for doing things like demanding food, gold, and sex with women of the Lucayan people of the Bahamas, then chopping off ears, noses, and hands, and again, feeding dismembered but living people to dogs until he got his way. He forced people into labor, he sold women into sex slavery, and noted young girls could fetch an even higher price. He chained people to his ships and let hundreds of them die. He's responsible for disease and starvation that claimed lives estimated in the millions. According to ushistory.com, even his most ardent admirers acknowledge that Columbus was self-centered, ruthless, avaricious, and a racist. This man does not deserve the same national significance as veterans, Martin Luther King Jr., George Washington, or even Labor Day Joe, a Labor Day mascot I literally just invented. When we get new information, we should be able to make better informed decisions. A change of mind and culture should happen. To keep something just because, oh, that's the way I always thought it was, is a stupid rationale and shows your inability to adapt and apply critical thought. I'm not saying Italian Americans and Catholics shouldn't be celebrated, nor that any race of people are innately better than anyone else. I'm saying that while all groups of people, divided by race or religion or gender or geography or whatever, are imperfect, Christopher Columbus as an individual was a shitty person, unworthy of our national celebration. Perhaps a group of people who, I don't know, maybe lived on this land for thousands of years and have been historically displaced and disenfranchised by the rest of us deserve a little respect. They certainly deserve it more than that asshole Columbus. And while we're on the subject, how about replacing one of those Confederate generals with a statue of Captain Kirk? As a 
many of us know, the legacy of Columbus is something that has been complicated over the last several years. Um, and you've had many, many cities and universities and states uh, pushing to have us think differently about uh, Columbus the man and, and what we think about having a day that celebrates someone with uh, a legacy that is uh, not sort of singularly uh, positive in the way that we are often taught in our in our uh, American history classes in elementary school. So, you know, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, politicians have hailed Columbus as somebody who brought culture and civilization to Americas. And even today, Trump put out a statement and he said, quote, the permanent arrival of Europeans to the Americas was a transformative event that undeniably and fundamentally changed the course of human history and set the stage for the development of our great nation. End quote. So for a little historical context, the holiday officially began in 1937 following a huge um, influx of immigrants from from Italy uh, and the federal government proclaimed that Columbus Day would be a national holiday. Uh, but now, obviously, again, we're that legacy is being complicated and we don't see him just as this sort of skilled and courageous explorer who discovered the Americas, but someone who uh, was incredibly arrogant, who had a terrible administrative capacity and a sort of questionable morals. And we know that Columbus and the crews that he brought over, uh, the implications of them coming over resulted in the wholesale transfer of wealth, land, and resources from Native Americans to Europeans, that they enslaved indigenous folks, and that the European diseases that they brought over with them decimated Native communities by upwards of 90%. And so because we're starting to think differently about Columbus and his legacy, uh, since 1992, different cities across the country have been sort of stepping back their commemorations of Columbus. And and even in July 2015, Pope Francis, um, you know, Columbus is a, a known and noted uh, member of the Catholic Church. Uh, Pope Francis apologized on behalf of the Catholic Church saying, quote, for crimes committed against the Native peoples during the so-called conquest of the Americas. Um, and so, you know, obviously there is a long and complicated legacy with Columbus, as there are with many of the people who are associated with the founding of the Americas and the United States. Um, and and it's interesting to think about how we can conceive of his legacy differently uh, and do more to acknowledge the people who were actually here before him and who actually um, whose legacies have been sort of uh, erased wholly from from the narrative of the United States. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see that more and more cities are, are taking this up. It's important that cities are pushing back against the mythology of Columbus and Columbus Day, because, you know, what we know to be true is that not only did Columbus not discover America, right, that America clearly had a thriving uh, population and populations, many different peoples and tribes already lived here uh, that were decimated upon the arrival uh, of Columbus uh, and others from the West. But we also know that even the story about what happened when Columbus got here is untrue. So, you know, he wasn't even the first Western European to get here. Leif Erikson came from uh, Western Europe and arrived in uh, like 400 years before Columbus did. We know that when he did arrive, that he committed heinous crimes. Uh, you know, Columbus cut off the hands of native peoples and in ex if they didn't bring him as much gold as he wanted to, you know, he was a, a despicable man. And so I think, you know, it's important that cities are challenging the mythology of him and doing that through sort of this opportunity of critiquing and changing the holiday. I, I hope that more people will realize this and, and not only sort of deconstruct who Columbus was, but begin to learn more about the indigenous peoples who were here before Columbus and continue to be here uh, and celebrate that uh, through Indigenous Peoples Day. Yeah, um, just to put it in a bit of context, there are four states, three universities and 55 cities who officially celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day on today. Um, I think it's critically important that we acknowledge this history. Obviously, if we don't learn our history accurately, we're doomed to repeat it. Um, it's even more important, though, that for Native peoples in this country that we actually fulfill our treaty duties, which, quite frankly, are the very bare minimum of what we should be doing. Um, and we and, you know, the federal government is falling short of that every single day and everything from education to health care. Um, I often see, especially on Twitter, um, but I often see people essentially say, you know, that this is what happens 
when you lose the battle. Um, and this kind of you lost argument is built on the premise that a subjugation of other human beings is at all okay, which is deeply troublesome. Um, that's certainly beneath us. It's beneath our purported aspirations as a nation. Um, and if you... Uh, when I take some time this week to learn more about the history of indigenous peoples in this country, which I think is really important. Um, there's a great book called The Barbarous Years, um, which actually uh, properly displays and and walks through the history of America's early years and the kind of genocide that um that indigenous people went through. There's also a website that I often refer to because I'm really fortunate to work with a number of native people and American Indians here um, called manataka.org. It's M-A-N-A-T-A-K-A. And what it has is American Indian history as told by American Indians. And I'm I'm reading the title right now in case people are wondering about the nomenclature. There's often... um, what folks are choosing and self-determining to be called. Um, but there are multiple tribes and nations that have uh, histories that were previously oral that have been recorded on this website. And so as we think about people speaking for themselves, that is another really great resource. One of the things that's happening in Canada with the indigenous population is in some ways a form of reparations. In between the 1960s and 19. 19- 80s, Canadian social workers were forcibly separating Indigenous children from their families and putting them up for adoption by non-Native families in Canada and around the world. And the government just reached a settlement with the Indigenous populations. It'll affect as many as 30,000 people, and they're going to pay around $750 million in the settlement. So we've seen countries make amends for the terror that they inflicted on communities, uh, both a long time ago and even more recently. And I just want to make a quick note. I know that we've we've all been discussing um, and using the term like native communities and native uh, indigenous peoples and uh, things of that nature. But it's important just as a reminder that like Native Americans are not a homogenous group of people, that there are like many tribes and many communities with uh, many diverse cultural idiosyncrasies. And, and while we are using the term uh, or a different array of terms in order to to bring attention to a sort of larger demographic of people, it's always important to keep in mind that uh, there are many tribes within this larger demographic um, that have their own unique cultures, their own unique histories. uh, And that's just something important to keep in mind as we have these increased conversations about Indigenous peoples and and Native Americans, that there are uh, many folks who belong to those groups. Columbus Day is a big holiday in New York, where all the city's Italian-American community have a huge parade and celebration. But not everybody enjoyed the day off. Here to share his own unique perspective on this is totally biased writer and Indian-American, Hurry Kondabolu. Hurry! Christopher Columbus was a demon. He was, he was a fraud who murdered and enslaved thousands of Native Americans. But that's not the only reason I hate him. It's also personal. <laughs> Columbus is why I have to tell people that I'm Indian from India. <laughs> For real? Of course I am. That's where Indians originally come from. India, the factory that makes them. (laughs) How do you assume a place without silk, spices, or elephants is India? You have to be an idiot or an egomaniac. And judging by his hat, he was clearly both. (laughs) So I know a lot of Italian Americans love Columbus because he's their dude. But Italians, you got a lot of dudes. I mean, why not have Joe DiMaggio Day instead? (laughs) Right? He was a Hall of Fame baseball player with a record 56-game hitting streak. Look at his stats. 
Career 325 batting average, seven straight seasons of over 100 RBI, and most importantly, no career genocides. <laughs> The only Indians Joe DiMaggio ever slaughtered were from Cleveland. <laughs> One thing that makes me feel better about Columbus is that when he got to hell, and he definitely went to hell, <laughs> he probably thought to himself, fire, screaming, the devil, oh wow, I think I just discovered heaven. <laughs> So screw Christopher Columbus and long live Joe DiMaggio. Today, we're going to be talking about this thing called Columbus Day and the whole conversation that is not new. And the question is this, should it remain being called Columbus Day or should it be called Indigenous Peoples Day? The change to Indigenous Peoples Day has been getting a lot of momentum recently. Uh, Minneapolis, Seattle, the state of Alaska, Hawaii and Oregon have all renamed the day and... L.A. actually just passed a resolution that officially changes the name of that day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. And Mitch, you were the council member who pushed that initiative forward. Why was it so important to you? I, I was. And it's so interesting because I was elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 2013. Uh, and then I get on the city council and I am um, officially hosting the annual uh, Indian Native American Heritage Day and I'm surrounded by all these tribal leaders and these elders, and they're looking at me, and I, I'm realizing that I'm the first city council member that belongs to a federally recognized Native American tribe. And by year two, I thought, I, I can't let these folks down. I've, I've got to do what's right. Through a uh, nearly two-year-long process, we all together collaborated and landed on Indigenous Peoples Day. So, Chrissy, why do you think that Columbus Day should be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day? Well, for me, this is really about righting a historical wrong. Um, I really believe that we need racial justice and truth and reconciliation in this country. I think the events at Charlottesville have shown us an ugly side of white supremacy and white nationalism that we really need to fight against. And Indigenous peoples need to be included in those conversations. This isn't just some relic of history. Celebrating a genocidal figure such as Columbus has real consequences today uh, for our young people and for all of our community members. I don't know about you, Maria, but at least in the world, in the Latino digital space that I, I've been a part of, this is a really controversial subject. And it's really, really intense. But I think what I'm seeing recently is that sort of the connection between Columbus and white supremacy. Well, and also colonialism. Uh, this country was conned into celebrating Columbus Day during a period when Native Americans had no power whatsoever. Um, didn't even have the right to vote in, in, in some states until the 1940s. And it's just crazy to think that we uh, expect young people and anyone else for that matter to go along with the romanticized so-called discovery in the Columbian Exchange, which really the Columbian Exchange was just slavery. So I think, I think we shine a light on the truth. We flip the switch and we honor first peoples instead of, of this person who's, as Chrissy mentioned, associated with genocide. Now, I'm going to totally fess up here, guys. I'm half Paisan. My mom is Bronx Italian. Oh my God, I'm having a moment. Yeah, I'm, I was born in Puerto Rico. I'm, I was born in Puerto Rico and I'm a t my mom's family is um, Italian-American. I guess the question for you, Chrissy, was the debate really about Italian-Americans versus Native Americans? Like what, what, what was it about the debate like, that you saw from, from, from this change in the name? I'm glad that you asked that because a lot of people conflated 
Italian Americans and Columbus. And as you know, the Native community came to the table, we've actually had a, a forum where we came together and talked uh, the Native American community and members of the Italian community that were against the change. And honestly, after about two and a half hours of conversation, which was very emotional on both sides, um, you know, the majority of the Italian people in that room, we changed their hearts. Wow. They cared about Columbus Day because they cared about Italian people and Italian culture, and they wanted that celebrated, but that they recognized that this was not a good man, and they no longer wanted to be associated with him. Wow. There's actually a coalition of Italian-American academic and leaders in Los Angeles and in some other parts of Southern California who are actually petitioning against Columbus Day as a federal holiday because they also don't believe that Columbus is a good representative representation of Italian American heritage and culture. So the idea that this was Native Americans against the Italian community is a complete misnomer that that did not happen. There were a few Italian American leaders that, you know, uh, that were against the name change, but it wasn't the entire Italian American community. What's the big deal? We don't realize that at one point in this country, to be Catholic in this country, um, to be Italian Catholic, was to be persecuted. Right. This isn't about Catholicism, though. There's just no connection whatsoever with the man, Christopher Columbus, and Italian heritage. The country of Italy didn't even exist until, I think it was 1861, uh, nearly 400 years later. So I think that the two are conflated by some. W one of the results of the action we took on the city council was, I thought, very thoughtful. And that, that is... Because we know there's sensitivity uh, toward uh, to that date, we landed on October 12th as a day to recognize Italian American heritage, while, like I mentioned earlier, removing that stain on the administrative code. When you factor in the the statistics that are dire in in Native America, you have just off the charts early death, uh, infant mortality. Uh, diabetes, uh, school dropout, you name it. And that's just one of the results of, of a 500-year genocide. And we have to do all we can to bring that psychological harm to an end. And I think ending Columbus Day is part of that process. There's been a push to remove the statue of Columbus from Columbus Circle, which is kind of like, you know, it's a central location. Everybody knows Columbus Circle. What do you think about that? Should a place like New York City follow the lead of New Orleans and other cities that have removed monuments um, and removed Columbus from Columbus Circle. New Yorkers could engage in the same kind of dialogue we had in Los Angeles. And if Columbus Circle, they decide that the statue needs to be removed or placed somewhere else, that's how it'll be figured out. But I think that we're in the midst of a first people's awareness across the whole planet. No good can come from denying the truth. I, I have no fears that where these conversations will go, um, but I would, I would just urge everyone that engages in them to listen to one another um, and, and not be afraid to endeavor to move forward to have these types of conversations. Let me just lastly say about uh, something else that is unambiguous. Those Civil War monuments to the Confederate, uh, you know, so-called heroes, it's about time those came down uh, because those are symbols of hate and genocide and oppression. And and we can no longer tolerate that in, in this country. You know, I, I actually, um, I, I, I don't think that, like, I'm not in favor of also erasing the complexity of history. Right. And Columbus, um, you know, he was an essential part of history and and what and what ended up happening in the Americas. So I, I I was like, well, let's see what would happen if you wanted to get rid of Columbus, Columbus's statue um, in Columbus Circle. And I'm like, I have an idea. Like, what if around the circle we had four points that were like um, a re, una, una respuesta, like a response 
to that statue. So you don't remove the statue, but you build something within that space that has like that creates a dialogue. That's a good idea. Well, I I think it's a that's a nice idea. (laughs) But I really believe that we need to dismantle symbols of colonization and oppression. I don't think that having a picture of somebody who raped you in your living room and putting a, you know, putting some kind of ode to like, but I healed from it. I I personally just don't find that very palatable. I don't think that's acceptable. I, I really do think that we need to confront our history and not to uplift these people in statues. So if that statue came down and if some kind of other remembrance was in that circle, yes, absolutely. But I think the statue itself is problematic and and needs to come down. You know, I think Chrissy just hit on a theme. I think that we have to confront our history, but not erase it. And so how do you, how do you land that plane? Right. And that's the big question. Christopher Columbus was not a benign figure himself. I mean, he went back to Europe and he was persecuted and convicted of crimes because he, he did bad things to people. Um, So uh, it's true. I, I just think that there needs to be a, a huge nationwide education on on our our true history and colonization and all that that came after and, and the consequences that we're still living with and the, the harm that uh, that Native Americans are still living with to this day on reservations and in cities and towns and out in the country across this entire country. Uh, the consequences are deep and profound. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reckoning that we have to do. In my view, all symbols of colonization and oppression against people, those things should not be uplifted for us as a society. Uh, You know, but I also say that this is part of this very large movement that in a lot of ways was, there was a whole catalyst of what happened at Standing Rock. And, as a result, I really believe that we're in a political, cultural awakening. Uh, I think that, you know, our our elders, our ancestors are really calling us to make these changes for today and for future generations. Mm-hmm. And we have people from all across the country that are now calling us. Um, just cities in California alone. Last week, Burbank City changed uh, Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Tomorrow, the city of Long Beach is having the vote. Uh, LA County is is going to be voting on this Mm -hmm. tomorrow. I mean, cities across the country have been reaching out. So this is not just, um, you know, about what we believe. It's it's really about this whole consciousness raising all throughout the country, which is long overdue. I always say this, just be able to put your feet in someone else's shoes. We need more compassion in this world anyway. And to think that you can cavalierly just dismiss uh, a racial stereotype of the Redskins an exaggerated, you know, uh, figure, and and think that that doesn't affect uh, Native American kids, um, you know, going just going about their lives or families, and think that that's okay, is no longer acceptable. It just waving away the the uh, effects of of colonialism and the devastation of Native America uh, is no longer acceptable. Uh, I would like listeners to just keep something else in mind. The genocide that Christopher Columbus set in motion upon his first voyage in 1492 is the greatest genocide ever known on the planet. It it, it affected the entire Western Hemisphere, the consequences of which we're all living with today. So we have things to reconcile at the national and international level, but also just within ourselves. I mean, how do I reconcile my own feelings about things? I'm of mixed race. I'm mostly Irish, but I'm also patriotic. I love saying the Pledge of Allegiance and singing the National Anthem. Everyone should be entitled to that privilege, and and they're not as long as we have institutionalized symbols that are racist and, and harmful psychologically. That's what we've got to address, because un- until we do, n- there's not a level playing field for everyone. And, and I think it's time to, as Chrissy mentioned, raise that consciousness, and we'll all be better off as a result.
We just heard clips today starting with one of Roger Ray's Progressive Faith sermons in which he discussed the origin stories we write for ourselves and how the words we use affect how we think. The Canary Effect laid out some terrible truths about Christopher Columbus, followed by a similar rundown of atrocities on the Tom Hartman program. The Young Turks argued why Columbus Day needs to be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Pod Save the People, likewise, stressed the need to reframe the debate over Columbus. Hari Kondabolu explained his personal reasons for hating Christopher Columbus in a segment on Totally Biased with W. Kamau Bell. And finally, we just heard In the Thick hosting a thoughtful conversation on how and why we need to transition away from celebrating Columbus Day. Members will be getting a bonus episode with a few additional clips on today's topic. We'll hear some voices from protesters explaining why they're calling for a change to Columbus Day. We'll hear from a progressive candidate who won her congressional primary and could be one of the first two Native Americans. American women in Congress, and still more, we'll hear an analysis of the historical relationship between humans arriving in the Americas and the ecological effects from 30,000 years ago up to today. To hear all of that and for other details on membership, visit patreon.com slash bestofleft. You can find that link in the show notes on your devices, which is also where you can find links to each of these segments in today's episode for easy reference and sharing. And now, we'll hear from you. Hey, Jay, it's Nate from Vacaville, um, and I was just calling because I had one more idea for activism related to voter suppression. Part of our positive agenda for counteracting voter suppression should be advocacy for a election day holiday. Um, there's a bill called Democ- for what would, would be called Democracy Day, um, which would just be a day off to celebrate our right to vote to discuss political issues and to vote. And that's a a national holiday, and that's definitely not going to happen right now, but we don't have to wait to take action. You can advocate on the state and local level, and maybe we could get results that way, but also, if you can, please do not go to work on election day. Take a leave of absence, use a vacation day, whatever you can do without taking any risks you aren't willing to take, This next election, you know, is very important. And vacation days are also very important. But I think that, you know, many of the listeners here, if they're honest with themselves, they would know what priority to put on the vacation day. So on the day off, though, what you should be doing is take helping get people to the polls in any way that you can. And you want to talk about this as an act of protest against voter suppression and in support of Democracy Day. And maybe we could get some concessions from companies giving more time off for their workers to vote, state and local people getting more time off to vote, more protections, maybe even some state and local democracy days. Maybe we wouldn't get any concessions. But if we, even if we don't, the cool thing is that we're still helping us, helping our chances in the next election. So yet yeah, the two most powerful tools that we have on the left is our vote and the ability to withhold our labor. And Yeah, why not do them both at the same time? Thanks, Jake. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Now, believe it or not, I have yet more for you. One quick little bonus clip I need to play because, uh, well, I'll tell you the background story. It should be obvious, but I'll tell you straight up, clearly there is so, so much more to be said on this topic. I I feel like we simultaneously are at a point of awakening and the campaign against Columbus Day is, is really gaining power. But at the same time, that is so just the tip of the spear. It is like the smallest issue. It, like, it's important. It's symbolic. As Roger Ray said, the words we use make a difference, and it changes how we think about things. So it's it's totally important. But at the same time, there are so many super serious issues that need to be dealt with, all relating to the history of colonialism and the impacts they've had on Native people's 
throughout the Americas. That said, I plan to do more episodes on this topic, but diving into deeper, more specific areas, not just Columbus, but what happened after that and where we are now. So, And honestly, this is a topic I should have dived into before now, long, long before now. I'm ashamed that I didn't. Uh, frankly, we, we have uh, Dr. Roger Ray, who we heard from today, to thank for today's episode. As you may remember, uh, people on Patreon now get to vote on upcoming topics. I put out a list of you know about a half a dozen options for topics, but I'll always leave it open for people su- to suggest something else on their own. And Roger Ray suggested an episode on Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day. It's been an issue that he's been on top of for years, and frankly. I had sort of meant to do this before, but always just sort of forgot or didn't have the chance. Anyway, I I don't have a good excuse. I haven't done it up to this point. I I meant to. So I I plan to do more episodes on more deeper topics sort of on the same genre. But during my research for today's episode that gave me some insight into all of the different directions uh, this topic can go, uh, I found one thing that I simply, like, I'm not going to be able to fit it into a show. I can't even make a bonus episode about it. So all I can do is play a little clip for you and suggest you go check it out for yourself. So this little bonus clip I have for you is uh, from a public radio show produced in New Hampshire called Outside In. I think they write it outside slash in. And they did a series called Powerline, and it relates to New Hampshire because it's about a, a proposed work project to run a big power line through New Hampshire, but then they peel away one layer of the onion after another after another, and it dives deep into the history of the French and the British in uh, the Quebec province in Canada, and then dives even deeper into the original colonization and the native peoples who live in that area and the complicated mix of conflicts that are happening all between these groups of people, the histories of them, the you sort of get the perspectives from all sides, and uh, and then you're sort of left to come to your own conclusions. But to give you a sense, here's a quick clip. Remember, this is a community that voted 70% in favor of making a deal with Hydro-Quebec. But these frustrations with the company are about more than just dams and reservoirs or security checkpoints. Like the indigenous movement as a whole, at their root, these conflicts are about land rights, about the legacy of colonialism, about all of the personal slights that First Nations people have felt over their whole lifetime. Slights that no amount of money can erase. Conversations like this one happened a lot when we were up in Canada. We would ask them to talk about how flooding had impacted their traditional lifestyle, and they'd lead off by telling us how Native people were forced to attend Catholic residential schools, how they were punished for speaking their language or practicing their customs. Hydropower has its impacts, but those impacts are all muddled together with everything else European colonization has visited upon Native people. For us, at times, it was dizzying. It was hard to sort it all out. As we came back home, drove hours in the car, and talked about everything we had heard, what we settled on is this. Opposition to hydro development is about something much bigger than the actual projects themselves. So there you go. I think that gives you a sense, uh, you know, just a, a taste of where that series ends up going and and the types of stories that it ends up weaving through and, and the really hard discussions that have to be had and and the fundamentally complicated nature of all of it so it, it's really worth muddling through I, I think you'll understand why I can't pull like a quick clip and say like here's the essence of it because you really just sort of have to marinate through the whole thing. Uh, So if you want to hear that, and I I hope you do, the show again is called 
Outside In, and the series is called Power Line, episodes one through four, and they're not that long. I think each episode is less than 30 minutes, so uh, absolutely worth your time and, and not a gigantic commitment, so check that out. That's going to be it for today. Uh, keep the comments coming in. As always, the number to dial 202-999-3991. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash bestofleft. That is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and right on the device you're using to listen. So, coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors of the show from bestoftheleft.com. Mm-hmm.